This is a compilation of all of the vaults from the Fallout series, all in numerical order. This will not, however, cover Vault 33 from the new TV series, as we don't know much about that yet, aside from the fact that it is clearly a vault similar in style to Vault 76 and Vault 101, but we will look to cover the show in a future episode. This compilation will also include all of the non-canon and cut vaults from other planned Fallout games and the extended universe. Also, a big apology for the difference in my microphone sound. I've upgraded this setup since these videos and unfortunately there's a big difference but hopefully it's not too distracting for you. But with all that said, sit back, relax and enjoy some Fallout lore as we explore the horrors of what was known across America as Project Safe House, the saving of humanity from nuclear war but also an opportunity for Vault Tech and the government to test on their public. This is all of the Vault lore from the Fallout universe. As the war within the Middle East was getting more and more heated, the government had to act and, as mentioned before, had to set up Project Safe House in 2054. One problem with this was that the funding was low due to how bad the economy was within America and within the rest of the world, as well as resources were running dry everywhere. Luckily, as vault Tech began getting things ready for their construction, a technological breakthrough happened, which allowed these gigantic bunkers to be created and constructed at a rapid pace. To prove to the government that these bunkers were worth investing in to protect its civilians, vault -Tec created a concept vault to show how they would be used and how they worked. This concept vault was created outside of the vault -Tec headquarters within Los Angeles and would be simply labelled as the Los Angeles Vault. After seeing how it worked, the government invested in vault -Tec, asking them to create a total of 122 vaults across the country, which would reportedly save 0.1% of the American population from the inevitable nuclear holocaust. As the Great War approached and the nuclear bombs started to be fired, the Los Angeles vault was sealed and kept its residents safe from the bombs. Proving that these vaults actually worked, the original concept vault was able to survive the war and protected everyone inside. Eventually in the year 2092, the doors opened once again as its inhabitants ventured out and went on to settle in the boneyard and continued to set up their town of Adatum. Some however remained within the vault up until 2155, however one faction was growing in force during this time, that faction being the Master's Army known as Unity, a group set up to reform humanity under a new image of the super mutants. The Master would take humans and dip them into the FEV virus, turning them into super mutants, growing their numbers and helping them to become a dominant force within the wasteland. Because of this goal, the Master took to the Los Angeles vault and used its residents to dip them into his forces. But this vault was a great place for the Master to set up his main base and conduct his operations. It would be here in this vault where he would be Based, and with that would construct a cathedral above it. For almost a decade, the Master's forces would be based here within the cathedral and Los Angeles vault, until the year of 2162, where the vault would be infiltrated and destroyed by the vault dweller, who killed the Master in the process and detonated a nuclear bomb located within the facility. The original vault set up by vault -Tec was proof that their concept worked, and it would in fact protect its residents from the horrors of the nuclear war. However, it would be the events of the post-war which would eventually destroy it, rendering this vault useless to all now. Vault 3 was constructed within the Mojave Wasteland in the southwestern part of Las Vegas. This vault's original concept was not to experiment on its residents, but in fact was one of the 17 control vaults. The inhabitants of this vault enjoyed life there. It was safe and things were running relatively well. However, within the 23rd century, the vault suffered from a water leak within part of the vault. The leak was so severe that the residents were forced to open up the vault doors to find help out in the wasteland. As the vault dwellers ventured out to find help, they would get along with a lot of the towns outside living within the wasteland and were going to set up trade links and relationships that would help them grow. For a few weeks, the recently emerged vault dwellers were doing well, but sadly news traveled fast about this vault that they had recently opened, attracting the faction known as the Fiends. The Fiends would venture to this vault and would speak with the vault dwellers, but because of the vault dwellers naivety and lack of security, the Fiends were able to successfully con them and take their vault from them. The Fiends would slaughter all 
of the inhabitants living within the vault and would set it up as their impenetrable base of operations, growing stronger and stronger over the time they spent there. Vault 3 was a paradise. It was a real safe haven for those that lived there originally. Whilst they were isolated from the rest of the world, they were able to maintain order, run a democratic society, and could live their lives without worry about the barbaric nature of the outside world. If the water leak didn't happen, these residents could have lived out the rest of their lives in the safety of Vault 3. But alas, all their residents lay dead as the fiends grow in their numbers, becoming a nuisance for the rest of the Mojave Wasteland. Vault 8 was like Vault 3 in the sense that it was also one of the 17 control vaults without an experiment taking place. Nothing much really took place within Vault 8, it just had one simple goal, that was to open 10 years after the bombs fell in 2087. However this did not happen and in fact in 2079 the residents were given the all clear signal and emerged from their vault. Luckily the inhabitants were equipped with a Garden of Eden creation kit and once emerging from their vault would go on to establish Vault City. As time progressed, Vault City grew in size with its population gaining in numbers. It was a safe haven for those rare few that were allowed residency within the city. Vault 8 was still used however. In 2241 the vault became one of the best medical centers within the wasteland outside of the Enclave or Brotherhood of Steel bases. This vault would house the finest medical treatment, a brilliant power source, an information hub that had a ton of computers and archives, and a large storage space for ore and other supplies essential to the world being of the city. Whilst the citizens of the city rarely, if ever, ventured into the lower levels of the vault, it is clear that Vault 8 is still working to the benefit of the vault dwellers and it's used to great effect to help power and maintain this fantastic city. It is one of the most efficient vaults on this list and still to this day is probably still in operation, helping the civilians of the wasteland get to the finest medical treatment and information to help them grow as a civilization. Vault 11 is the first example of a vault with a terrifying experiment used on its inhabitants. Vault 11 might seem like a standard control vault, but realistically its main ambition was to run a simple social experiment. The experiment here was its inhabitants were told that they must sacrifice one of their fellow vault dwellers each year, and if they refused to do so, the vault's life support system would be permanently shut down and all would die, or so the vault stated anyway. In reality, the test was to see how long it took for the residents to all join together and go against the rule of the vault. Once they did, they would be let free and be praised for joining together with the vault automated response system saying they were a shining example to humanity. During this time however, elections took place to see who would be the chosen one to be sacrificed every year to the vault so the rest may live. The person with the most votes would be selected as the overseer and at the end of the year they would then be killed and elections would start all over again. The first sacrifice made to the vault was the original overseer who knew about the original experiment but hid it from the rest of the population. In response to this, the residents decided that it must always be the overseer who should be sacrificed, hence why the elections took place every year. As time progressed on, elections became more of a way of getting rid of people groups didn't like. Powerful groups would make it so that elections were rigged, as well as posting propaganda up on the walls to try and force the population into getting rid of their chosen candidates. This sparked up battles between groups, with one lady known as Catherine Stone going around stalking and killing members of their group known as the Justice Bloc to try and save her husband, who had been nominated by them for Overseer. Due to this act, Catherine would be captured and would become the next Overseer. However, as Overseer, Catherine would enforce Overseer Order 745, meaning that the election process would not be down to a democratic vote, but would be chosen by the vault's computer system and a random number generator meaning anyone could be up for the role of overseer and no one had a choice who they wanted to sacrifice. This order however caused panic and upset and eventually led to fighting with almost all of the residents being killed in the process. Eventually only five residents remained within the vault and in an act of suicide they defied the vault computer that year and did not send a sacrifice. After this happened the vault congratulated them and gave them all their freedom. However upon hearing the truth about the vault's experiment the survivors committed suicide to punish them for what they had done, recording the whole situation on the holotape. Four gunshots were heard, with one person at the end of the tape being heard sighing and dropping their weapon. 
To this date, Vault 11 remains a tomb displaying some of the horrific events that Vault Tet put on its inhabitants. And the sad tragedy of the tale was that if they had just been told the full truth by the Overseer behind the experiment at the beginning, and if they had all joined together, all of the residents could still be alive, and have that freedom the Vault was going to reward them with in the end. Vault 12 was another vault that advertised itself as being a game changer and a place where humanity could thrive, but underneath hid a horrible experiment on its inhabitants. Vault 12 was constructed under the sprawling metropolis of Bakersfield and was said to be built with every amenity in mind for the prospective vault dweller. It was also said to be fitted with the newest in vault water purification system, which would be able to take even the waste located in the sewers and convert it into refreshing, drinkable water, able to deliver over 15,000 gallons every day. If you were to sign up to this vault, you would receive the Pressed Vault Suit Award for your efforts. But on the 23rd of October 2077, when the bombs fell, it became apparent to the citizens of Bakersfield that all the other vaults had already been sealed off. Desperate to survive, they would flood into Vault 12, forcing themselves past others to guarantee their survival. However, once all the residents were in, the true nature of this vault came into effect. The vault door did not shut, which was planned by Vault Tech. The idea behind this vault was to experiment on the dwellers and see how they coped under the effects of radiation. As the bombs hit, the radiation from them flooded into Vault 12, coating everyone in there. Those who were able to survive the events that took place would be heavily ghoulified by the radiation and forever changed by it. By 2083, the survivors would eventually leave their supposed shelter and venture out into the wasteland. However, those that stayed within Vault 12 went on to found the city of Necropolis under the leader of Set, who took over control from the original Overseer in 2084. Necropolis would continue to survive going into the next few decades, with it being a safe haven for all those mutated by the nuclear war. Whilst the Ghouls now feel safe in their city, it is pretty clear that Vault 12 was one of the most barbaric experiments vault Tech could do to its population, and now a vast number of Ghouls bear their scars of the horrors of this past organisation. Vault 13 was like Vault 12 in the sense that it also advertised itself as having an endless supply of pure water that the inhabitants could gain access to. This was all thanks to its location within the scenic mountainous region of South California. Vault 13 was one of the most ambitious vaults created by Vault Tech, which started in 2063 and finished in 2069. The vault would also be heavily protected being located under 3.2 million tons of soil, which was 200 feet of thick. It was also designed to hold 500 occupants in 100 comfortable quarters with a maximum of 1,000 occupants with hot bunking and double quarter assignments. Vault 13 was also one of the most expensive vaults costing the American government over $645 billion, 150% over their original budget of $400 billion. Although this vault might have been seen as a control vault, it was actually another experiment vault, but not nearly as bad as the previous ones. The the experiment here was to keep the vault dwellers locked up for 200 years to see what happened when the dwellers were put under prolonged isolation. However, this experiment was to fail as the overseer needed to find a new way to get water for its vault dwellers after their vault's water chip began to fail before the year of 2161. Without this water chip, the purification system that was helping these vault dwellers stay alive would fail, meaning they could not live there anymore. They needed to find a new one if they were to survive. Overseer Jack O'Ren had no choice but to send out a search party to find one, breaking Vault Tech's experiment. But by 2161, however, the chip completely broke and forced the vault into a state of emergency, with the vault dwellers only having 150 days worth of water reserves left. Venturing out of the vault, the unknown person known as the Vault Dweller would be able to salvage a chip from the Necropolis Vault 12, as well as discover the being known as the Master. The Overseer couldn't have the Master and his forces learning about their vault, so once again sent the Vault Dweller back to deal with the Master at the Cathedral, successfully killing him and destroying all he had been working on. Finally returning to the Vault, however, the Overseer would cast the Vault Dweller out to preserve the Vault's true experiments. But this turned all the other Vault Dwellers against the Overseer, leading many to leave the Vault in outrage. This also led the Overseer to being imprisoned, tried, and sentenced to death. As the Vault Dwellers from Vault 13 continued on now within the Wasteland, they would set up the town of Orio and would set up Vault 
13 as a shrine to their hero, to uphold the memory of them and the actions they had done to save their lives. As life continued within Vault 13, they would get a message on their new Vault computer stating it was time to leave the Vault. However, as they emerged, the dwellers were attacked and enslaved by two Enclave Vertibird assault squads. In May 2242, the Enclave would continue on and would go on to deploy a unit of intelligent Deathclaws to obscure their actions and patrol the nearby area for stragglers. However, the Deathclaws refused to take their orders and turned Vault 13 into their home. Here they would set up a den for their mother, Kirith, and took in various humans as their inhabitants. Most accepted their presence, however few attempted to take out the Deathclaws, and eventually Frank Horrigan of the Enclave invaded Vault 13 and wiped out all of the Deathclaws and humans inside. After the Enclave's involvement, no one remained in Vault 13, and it is unknown what the future holds for this once monument of vault Tech creation. It is unknown, but it is likely that it is owned and run by the NCR, but it is clear that the Vault 13's history has been filled with betrayal and death, and whoever runs it now might not be safe from outside forces wanting to control the wasteland. Vault 15 might be one of the most significant vaults on this list that would lead to a vast amount of the factions we see within Fallout, including the incredibly powerful New California Republic. This vault was actually one of the few vaults that had an incredibly smooth construction and suffered no delays. This was yet again another experiment vault, and its experiment this time was to place together people who held radically diverse ideologies and cultures to see how they reacted to being in the same small environment as one another. Vault Deck would then monitor their interactions and see how quickly it would fall or even thrive in the 50 years it had planned to stay sealed for. However, as the bombs fell, the vault lost all contact with the outside and all the other vaults meaning the experiment could not be monitored. As the years went on, the vault continued to deteriorate and its population became extremely overcrowded by 2097, leading to even more poor living conditions. Conflict was inevitable and in the spring the situation exploded. A schism arose among Amongst the dwellers as the vault was finally opened. Most of the dwellers marched out stripping the vault of all its important resources and equipment, including the Garden of Eden creation kit, but one group remained within the vault trying to live off the bare minimum the vault had left. Those who left formed into separate groups, the most significant one of these being the village of Shady Sands, created by the Gek. The rest of the individuals would band into raider tribes such as the Khans, Jackals and the Vipers, who would terrorise the new California waste for years on end. Vault 15 remained in operation for a while, being inhabited by the remaining dwellers. However, not long after these factions rose to power, the vault was invaded by raiders and because of it was abandoned. With no one inhabiting the vault, it started to deteriorate over the years, with its second and third levels completely collapsing. After the NCR formed, the vault was somewhat left alone because of the salvaging rights made between the NCR and other parties. Eventually, it was inhabited by a group of wastelanders who just needed a place to live. The Wastelanders settling here believed the lies of the new Khans who told them that they would rebuild the vault and provide them with shelter, food and water. But hearing that they were being lied to by their new Khans, the settlers would strike a deal with the President Tandy and the NCR, which would allow the NCR access to the vault and the squatters with annexation, education and supplies to survive. With all this done, the NCR would continue their expansion and the squatters learned self-sufficiency and became productive members of society. Vault 15, however, would remain a memory of the past, a place where all of these factions once lived during the Great War. Sadly, not much is known about Vault 17. However, it is known that some of the vault dwellers who inhabited it are still alive, living out within the Mojave Wasteland. From what we know, Vault 17 was a fine place to live up until 2155, where the Masters faction Unity invaded the vault, capturing the inhabitants and subsequently turning them into super mutants. After the Masters passing, only three members of Vault 17 are said to be alive, those being Lillian, Marie Bowen, Becky, and Jimmy. It was said that Lily lived in the vault until the age of 75, where they were invaded, captured, and were turned into Nightkin. Maybe one day we will get to witness what happened within Vault 17, or get to go back to see what has happened to it since 2155, but for now, it is just a mystery vault.
Vault 19 is a tale of two halves, literally. Laying out within the Mojave Wasteland, this vault would be located above a parking lot. Venturing down, the vault would be segregated into two different coloured sections, red and blue. And once assigned to one of those sectors, the inhabitants would have limited contact with the other half. Vault 19 was in fact the only vault that had two overseers, obviously one for the red sector and one for the blue sector. The main experiment of this vault was to test the inhabitants' paranoia. Whilst they lived there, the citizens would be exposed to different forms of psychological factors that would make them feel like something was constantly wrong. This would be through non-chemical and non-violent means, with one child stating in his terminal that it might be subliminal messaging as he and his friends could hear high-pitched noises. Throughout their time within the vault, many of the residents showed signs of paranoia, and almost all of the time the residents blamed it on the other sector of the vault. Some stated that they were hearing noises, feeling unusual drafts of air from vents, as well as seeing the lights blinking patterns like some sort of code. For so long the residents blamed it on the other side, but the truth was it wasn't them. It was in fact the overseers at the direction of vault with some also believing the vault doctors were involved as well. By the 23rd century this vault is now void of its original inhabitants, with no real sign as to what exactly happened there. It is believed that their paranoia took over completely and caused them to kill one another. It is also believed that it could be the water filtration system poisoned them, or that the geckos broke through from the sulfur caves and killed them all. But despite the unknown whereabouts of the vault dwellers, it is known that during the events of the NCR expansion, some convicts from the NCR correctional facility had escaped their capture led by Samuel Cook and discovered this hidden vault. Seeing it was completely abandoned, the powder gangers would set up here and look to rebuild their forces so they could venture out and take over towns of their choosing. But for now, the original residents of Vault 19 are no more. Maybe down to their own paranoia caused by the overseers and Vault Tech's horrible red versus blue experiment. Another vault located within Las Vegas is Vault 21, once a safe haven for the vault dwellers, now a hotel within New Vegas that is a main source of income for Mr. House. Vault 21 was actually set out to be a really great place to live, but once again it had an experiment that took place there, this one being a bit odd. Vault 21 made sure that everyone within the vault was completely equal to one another, so much so that the vault's layout was perfectly symmetrical to show that everything must be balanced. The one difference with this vault was if anyone had a conflict with anyone, the only way they could solve their problems would be through gambling. Once a conflict was being arranged, the chosen representative winner would earn the right to settle the dispute as wished by the collective. All seemed well within the vault and actually a lot of their problems were solved and it always kept their equality going throughout their years living there. However, in 2274, Robert House contacted the residents at Vault 21, offering them the chance to help rebuild Vegas back to its glory days. Most of the vault dwellers did not want to accept accept this offer from the house, as they liked the way they had been living in their safe haven. However, a small minority of the residents did want to take that offer. Because of this, the ones wanting to take the offer challenged those who wanted to stay isolated. After playing a few hours of blackjack, those who wished to venture outside won the game and went on to accept House's offer. As they told Mr. House they had accepted his offer, he immediately ventured into the vault, stripping it of all its technology and resources and used it to rebuild the strip. After doing this, Mr. House ordered them to fill the vault with concrete, but thanks to the request of Sarah and Sheldon Weintrup, set up a hotel in the upper levels to help House gain more of an income from his New Vegas empire. Most of the vault dwellers of Vault 21 ventured out to live new lives amongst the communities and forgot of their past within the vaults, most notably one man living in Good Springs known as Doc Mitchell. Vault 21 is a good tale of an equal society going well for many years, however ultimately in the end, one lesson can be learnt from it. No matter how equal you think you are, the house always wins. Continuing on into the Mojave Wasteland is Vault 22, one of the most unique but terrifying vaults in all of Fallout. This vault was originally designed as a green vault, a place that would focus on sustaining plant life and experimenting on new species of greenery. Most of these experiments would be run of the mill, however one that would be most successful would be the vault's undoing. During their time here, the vault dwellers running the experiments would be donated a fungus by a defense contractor. This fungus would be known as the Bulvaria modicana 
Sultana, which was a fungus used to be a form of pest control. When the spores hit the body of the host, it would take over, colonizing the body, and eventually would be killed due to a lack of body functions. However, the problem with the fungus was that it reanimated the body and continued to control it. Originally developed by the scientists within the X-22 Botanical Gardens in Big Mountain, the scientists would begin using it during and after the events of the Great War. After initially using it, fungal spores would begin spreading throughout the vault, infecting all the population. Isolating one of the first infected scientists, Dr. Harrison Peters, the others would watch as it took over his body, killing him from the inside out, and then reanimating him and turning him into an extremely aggressive host. Eventually, the spores took over pretty much the whole vault, turning the deceased human scientists into spore carriers, killing anything in their path and blending in with the plants within the labs to surprise their foes. By 2096, a party of 118 survivors made it out of the vault and made their way for the Zion Canyon. As the survivors tried to live their lives out there within the wide open wasteland, the vault itself fell into disrepair, overrun by plants and wildlife. Occasionally, scavengers ventured into the vault to look for salvage, but would be overrun by the wildlife and taken by the spores. Signs outside of the vault would display warnings for anyone who made it there and wanted to look inside, but the greenery of the environment was appealing and almost drew you in to see what was inside. Sadly, once again, Vault 27 is a very unknown vault that has only been mentioned in traveling. However, it is said that this vault had a pretty horrific experiment. That being, the vault was deliberately overcrowded to see how people reacted to these close quarters. 2,000 people were assigned to enter this vault, but the vault only had room for 1,000 inhabitants, meaning that those who entered here to escape the bombs were in for an extremely claustrophobic experience. Now take this vault with a pinch of salt because whilst it has been mentioned in the games, it is not 100% whether this law is true or not and may not be canon as of yet. But it is believed that Vault 29 is another experimental vault where only those who are under the age of 15 are allowed to gain access. With the experiment created by the scientist known as Derek Greenway, most of the parents were either accidentally redirected to other vaults or were in the early stages of health conditions that would no doubt cause them to die soon after after entering the vault. Vault 29 would also be controlled by a Zax supercomputer, which would be used to raise children with the aid of robotic helpers. They would then be educated in a primitive culture and then released into a controlled environment once reaching maturity. Explaining his plans to Diana, the human brain connected to a powerful computer, Greenway wanted to see what her opinion was on the matter at hand. Diana, however, was appalled by this and said that although it was intriguing, it was morally wrong on so many levels. She exclaimed that it needed to be scrapped, but Greenway refused. Because of this, Diana took it upon herself to change his plan completely. Diana would take control of a satellite dish and aimed it at Vault 29, transmitting a series of security codes to the Vault Zax unit. She would gain control of it and raise the children in a way that was seen in her eyes as morally correct. Eventually, the children would go on to set up the village of twin mothers on top of the vault and set up the religion that worshipped the nature goddess. Diana would continue continue to maintain the vault through her robot workers as well as protect all of her children to make sure her image of a goddess was preserved. By 2253, the vault itself had ceased working. However, thanks to Diana's intervention, the vault itself is still a holy place for the inhabitants of Twin Mothers. Vault 34 is a vault where if you pick the gun nut perk in your character's creation, you'll absolutely love to live here, to some extent. Here, the vault armory was massively overstocked with weapons and ammunition, and every dweller was able to access it at any time. Along with that, it also had a ton of amenities, such as a fully-sized swimming pool, which came at the cost of living space. For the first century, the vault was working exactly as planned. The vault was becoming extremely overpopulated, and violence was sprouting up. But in 22. 30, large groups of residents started to suggest that reproductive rights should be limited. Because of this suggestion, violence got worse throughout the population. To control this, the overseer stated that if this continued, all weapons would be confiscated. However, this did not help 
and a vast amount of dwellers left the vault and settled within the Nellis Air Force Base, labelling themselves as the Boomers. The Overseer couldn't let this get worse and because of it installed an armoury lock on his terminal, but the dwellers were getting tired of this Overseer's rule and were angry at the limitations being put on them. The Overseer in response set up guards on any exit and secured all doors to make sure no one else could leave the vault. On top of this, he also sealed away the armoury so no one could access it anymore. Fights continued, however, as the dwellers were desperate to get to the armoury. Eventually, there were not enough guards to protect the vault's key resources from the angry dwellers. Whilst the Overseer remained in control, he now had another problem. The vault was now leaking radiation, and this was affecting the technicians in the area, such as Chris Haversum, who was convinced he was becoming a ghoul. Luckily for Haversum, he was able to leave the vault, but for the rest, the radiation levels grew more and more, which led to mass violence amongst the people. Eventually, damage to the reactor meant even more radiation filtered through the vault in a large explosion, wiping out most of the dwellers and turned a lot of them into feral ghouls. Some of the dwellers did survive though and did not turn into ghouls. However, instead, they were trapped within the southern section of the vault due to a bomb being planted in the pool, exploding and causing the doors to automatically seal. By 2281, those survivors are still there, praying someone will come to save them. We finish off our vault list for this video with three that are sadly some of the smaller vaults unknown to us as of yet. Our first is Vault 36. This vault's main experiment was believed to be to see how the residents responded to terrible foods during their time there. The only notable thing about this vault was that the food extruders within it were designed so that they only produced thin, watery gruel for their residents. The idea of being fed only this for the rest of your life would most likely cause you to become highly irritated and eventually a aggressive to others around you as you lack basic nutrients, eventually causing a lot to most likely starve or kill one another as they are so desperate for other forms of food. Vault 42 is quite similar in this aspect, but instead of food, it was like provided. In Vault 42, the experiment was to see how vault dwellers responded to being in really dimly lit living situations. This vault was only being lit by 40 watt bulbs, nothing more, nothing less. This meant that dwellers would be roaming around in almost pitch black conditions, leading most to paranoia as they are in a constant state of darkness. This would most likely increase aggression amongst the population and drive some to go outright insane. Insane, never knowing what time of day it was. And finally, we end on Vault 43 for now. This is probably one of the most bizarre vaults of all time, but if the dwellers were smart, could probably overcome the obstacle and live a pretty all right life. This vault would be inhabited by 20 men, 10 women, and of course, because why not, one big panther that would no doubt be extremely hungry. How they got the panther in there without the dwellers knowing, I don't know, and what they wanted to achieve from this experiment is a complete mystery and quite obvious what's going to happen. But no doubt, if you went into this vault, you would most likely be eaten within moments by this vicious beast. However, I still personally think if they are smart enough, they could lure it into a room, seal the doors, and then continue to live in harmony. Humans are smart, and with 30 of them, I am pretty sure they could tackle this obstacle. Obviously, depending on what else is in that vault. But yeah, anyway, 43 is 20 men, 10 women, and of course, a panther. Vault 51 looks like your standard run-of-the-mill vault. However, unlike the other vaults, this vault was not assigned an overseer when it was first sealed shut in 2077. Instead, Vault 51 was fitted with a Zax supercomputer, which was originally put in as a way to use its computing powers to work out who the best candidate would be to run the role of overseer. This vault was then inhabited with 52 residents at first, with one being Sergeant Robert Baker, who was assigned as an assistant to Zax to help teach the computer what a true leader looked and behaved like, and how to determine who was the best candidate for the role. Robert Baker, when helping the Zacks, tried suggesting that the computer do this appointment through the democratic election process to honour the American way of doing things. Zacks instantly agreed, however, stating it would be their first experiment, making Sergeant Baker a bit worried about its true intentions. Unfortunately, the democratic process was a failure, as all the residents voted for themselves. The vault dwellers then tried a republic style of government, which also 
also failed, which led the Zacks to the conclusion that voting was pointless and it would terminate elections in the future and go with another process. Baker at this time was adamant that a true leader would step forward as that was what a leader would do in a time of crisis. This however was a terrible thing to tell the Zacks as it assumed the residents needed a crisis to show their true potential. Because of this line of thinking the Zacks would create crises to test the residents to see who the true leader was. By this point the vault factions had started to form and the vault was becoming extremely hostile. The Zacks started creating crises to panic the residents such as forcing the higher class citizens into extremely cramped conditions with only the clothes on their back. After more and more things were set up by the Zacks such as video game machines being tampered with to benefit some and disadvantage others, mass shootings and other crimes were occurring within the vault as people tried desperately to survive and be better than the rest. Baker by this point was outraged at what the Zacks had done and what it was continuing to do to its residents and stormed out of the vault. But the Zacks continued. After a few years of constant trials by the Zacks, causing distrust amongst one another, there was only one dweller remaining, a man named Reuben Gill, who was officially named the Overseer of Vault 51. But immediately the Zacks became disappointed with Reuben's role as Overseer and started locking him out of areas within the vault, including the security room. After years of depression being left on his own, Reuben resorted to alcoholism. But now the year was 2102 and the vault of Vault 76 had now opened and the Zacks saw an opportunity to find a new leader. It removed Reuben as overseer immediately and forced him to participate in the trials once again. Not wanting any part in this cycle once again, Reuben distracted the Zacks and escaped from the vault in a shipping crate. His mission was to finally take take out Zacks, trying desperately to communicate with anyone within the area that might seek out Vault 51. However, for the Zacks, it continued to look out for that next overseer, opening the vault doors and testing anyone who came in, pitting dwellers against each other in a test of may the best person win. Every test would be different, but only one could become the overseer. As of 2102, the Zacks still lives, testing all those brave enough to venture into this attractive vault within the Appalachian Forest. Vault 53 is a relatively unknown vault with its location being somewhat of a mystery, only being mentioned in passing. Vault 53 has a pretty simple yet infuriating experiment put on the vault dwellers. In this vault all the equipment within it would break down every few months or so. Whilst the equipment could be easily fixed, every month it would break again creating this cycle that was incredibly frustrating for the residents. Imagine living every day knowing that something was going to break and every time you fixed it, it was just going to break again in a few weeks. To be honest, it just sounds like every Adobe product or 343 Halo game. Eventually, it will drive you mad, and for these vault dwellers, if they didn't fix it, the whole vault would most likely just fall. Vault 55 and 56 are also extremely unknown vaults with no known location as of yet. These vaults were lumped together by Vault Tech in a sort of betting experiment to see which one fell first. Vault 55's main experiment was that all entertainment tapes were removed, meaning the vault dwellers had to come up with their own forms of entertainment to keep them going. It would be an extremely boring existence, but if you're not fussed about that sort of thing and see your own company or other people's company as good enough, then you'll probably be fine within this vault. Vault 56, on the other hand, also had its tapes removed, apart from one type. This tape was of a particularly bad comic actor. The vault dwellers would only be able to watch these tapes to keep them entertained. And apparently this comic actor was so bad that sociologists predicted that Vault 56 would fall before Vault 55. Quite honestly, these vaults don't sound that bad to live in, but I have to admit I'd rather be in a place where there are no entertainment tapes than a vault where it's just playing the same Adam Sandler movies over and over and over again until the day I die. Located out within the ash heap within Appalachia is Vault 63, which is located underground hidden away within a small building. This vault is extremely mysterious, said to be opened within the year of 2102, however for some reason was never opened, meaning its contents are completely sealed along with knowledge of its experiments. It was believed that inside the vault itself the reactor was overheating, which had potentially caused the vault to go into crisis mode, maybe killing the residents, however that is completely unknown. 
unknown. If the vault is ever unlocked to the rest of the world, those who venture in may have to take up the incredibly hard task of fixing the reactor whilst facing up against those inside if they have been turned into the scorched or ghouls. As of right now, sadly, Vault 63 remains a mystery and hopefully it will open soon. If not, it could be sealed shut for well over 200 more years. Probably some of the most spoken about vaults throughout the world, however vaults 68 and 69 are unfortunately hidden away and their location is pretty unknown. Both 68 and 69 had the same experiment in mind, but were the polar opposite of each other. Vault 68 consisted of 1,000 dwellers with 999 men and one lone woman, whereas Vault 69 consisted of another 1,000 dwellers with 999 women and one lone man. Whilst the idea of this vault may seem appealing, Healing at first, especially being that lone man, the idea of being the only one of your sex amongst the whole stadium of the other sex would be extremely daunting. And if the only way of continuing civilization is through you, both that lone woman and lone man are in for a horrible time and would probably get the punishment of death by Shnoo Shnoo. Yeah! yeah! <laughs> What are you, gay? The last of the smaller vaults for now is Vault 70, located out within Utah. This vault really wasn't anything special, with the only thing being mentioned about it being that the jumpsuit extruders failed after just six months. This meant that after six months, all new clothing provided would be stopped, and the vault dwellers would probably have to just deal with the clothing they entered with, as they would not be able to get any more. It was said that in 2062, however, over a decade before the Great War, Mormon congregations came together to purchase places within vaults 70 to set up their communion there. For over a century this community lived within Vault 70 and were finally released to the world in 2190, where the inhabitants would go on to found the town of New Jerusalem using their three Garden of Eden creation kits. To this day, sadly, the Mormon community in New Jerusalem has been taken out by angry tribals, raiders and other attackers and had to set up a new town within the ruins of Ogden, Utah, and called it New Canaan. It is unknown what has happened to Vault 70. Maybe some some of the Mormons still live there, or maybe it has just been left to decay. Maybe one day we will be able to see how the Mormons lived within the vault and how they dealt with the fact that they had no jumpsuit extruders. Vault 75 is probably one of the more barbaric uses of a vault that vault came up with. Before the war, there was a national emergency where people all over the country were concerned about what would happen to their children when nuclear war happens, if it happens. Because of this, vault and the local government of Massachusetts set up Vault 75 and placed it beneath the Malden Middle School, making sure those children at school had a quick place to evacuate to if the time came. All seemed good. This vault was encouraging families to sign up, authorizing special special discounts and subsidies for those qualifying families who had children under the age of 15, attending that school and lived in Malden. However, the true purpose for this vault was made by the United States military. The experiment here was to turn the children into battle-ready super soldiers who would obey any order given to them. This would be done by selective breeding, genetic modification and hormonal treatments. When the day came when the bombs hit, all those who qualified for the vault entered its premises. When they got there, the children under the age of 17 were taken to one side to meet the overseer. Those over the age of 17, such as the parents, would be taken to the holding area and executed by the security staff. This fate also hit those children who refused to be separated from their parents. Only strong children could pass these vault tests. Throughout the children's time here within this vault, they would be subjected to intense training regimes, strict diets, as well as a lesson on the art of war and simulated combat to help develop their physical traits and combat skills. The only way out of these tests was to have a cardiac arrest or to die during their time here. Eventually, if the child were to pass their time within the vault and reach the age of 18, they would be thrown out of the vault, being labelled as a graduation, and would be told to aid the surface by re-establishing civilization. Anyone who achieved an excellent or superior score in these tests would be used as the basis of the experiments and would be harvested for their genetic makeup, to be used on their next generation of test subjects 
who were created within vitro fertilization. Those who did not achieve those skills would be taken out of the population and killed by the staff. However, as the experiments went on and on, eventually the scientists would make those children into extremely adapted soldiers who were far more powerful than them with incredible gun skills and lightning speed. However, an insurrection was to take place at the hands of James S. and Rohit L., two of the residents of Vault 75, not long after the final subjects were made. Recruiting the other residents of the vaults, they all rallied together making sure all the children were safe and executed the scientists who were far weaker compared to these enhanced children soldiers. With this, the children were free from the horrors of Vault 75 and the experiments and creation of the super soldiers made from children was no more. It is still unknown where those children went, but for Vault 75, it is now inhabited by the gunners as they push through the Commonwealth, expanding their influence. Despite their activity within this vault, the horrific events of the past are still present as children's toys litter all of the rooms. A horrific tale of how Vault Tech exploited children and turned them into killing machines, or killed them if they were not deemed as worthy candidates. A vault mentioned all over America that was meant to be something truly special, however didn't really live up to its name in the long run. Vault 76 was set out to be the vault that celebrated America's history. It was designed as the official vault of the Tricentennial by Vault Tech and had the tagline of Vault Tech Salutes America. This vault was meant to be the best mines in all of America, capable of housing 500 residents, including students from Vault Tech University, military members, and former White House Chief of Staff. As the vault closed in 2077, Vault 76 had some of the best protection throughout all of the vaults, with their security team ready to take out any intruder that wasn't part of the Vault 76 family. Strict laws were in play as well to make sure all the residents of the vault played their part in keeping the society active and productive. If someone was to break laws or cause trouble, the overseer was able to lock down each of the rooms and imprison that person who caused trouble. Ensuring compliance was key to the goal of this vault and was one of the best examples of a control vault. Reclamation Day was soon approaching the residents of Vault 76, the time where they could venture out and help rebuild America. However, in 2100, there was a problem. The vault was now over capacity and all its resources were struggling because of it. Some of the residents had also been put under disciplinary lockdown as well, causing trouble for the overseer. On top of this, not a lot of the residents really wanted to venture out into the wasteland to fight against cannibalistic mutants, which added more problems to the overseer's Role. Eventually, the residents were convinced that venturing back to the surface was a positive thing, and by 2102, Reclamation Day was here, which was met with relief from all parties. A party was held the day before, allowing residents to have alcohol, food, and celebrate amongst their peers. After a long night of partying, the residents ventured out into the wasteland to rebuild Appalachia after 25 years of chaos. Residents weren't issued firearms, however, as the overseer denied them. Instead, just gave the residents the standard survival packages and were told to run fast and far away from Vault 76 and complete their missions. As all of the Vault 76 residents left, the vault became useless. It had fulfilled its task and all of the operations inside ceased working just 24 hours later. This included air circulation forcing the residents to leave if they were thinking of staying a bit longer. To this day, the banners of Reclamation Day as well as balloons surround the entrance of Vault 76 as its residents are out there trying desperately to rebuild America. America, forming groups amongst friends and fighting against terrifying creatures. Vault 76 would be remembered as one of the first vaults to open since the Great War and the start of the rebuilding process. Vault 77 is a bit of a weird yet somewhat terrifying tale of a single man who had been left to himself within the vault. Thinking this was some big joke, Vault Tech wanted to see how this man behaved, stuck on his own with one thing, a box of hand puppets. As the man searched the box labelled as P-13X US Government Issue Puppet Ration, he would find an assortment of puppets, however left them thinking they were useless. For the first month this lone vault dweller suffered serious depression due to being on his own as as well as overwhelming panic, believing this to all be a huge mistake. One year and three months later after the door was sealed, this vault dweller would eventually open the puppet box again to entertain himself. However, one puppet seemed to be speaking to him, that puppet being a vault boy. 
At first it seemed fine and the Vault Dweller came up with storylines for each of the puppets. However, one day the Puppet King was found killed and the Vault Boy was saying it was them. They were the ones who killed him. Now that they were both criminals to the other puppets, the Vault Boy said they should leave the Vault that night. Stepping out of the Vault that next morning, the Vault Dweller and his Vault Boy puppet would go on to explore the lands on the back of a fire ant, speaking to another Vault Dweller who was heavily ghoulified and tell him his own story. However, as time passed, the two were caught and tied up by a group of slavers. Threatening the Vault Dweller, the puppet stated the Vault Dweller had killed before. Not believing their claims, the slavers turned their back. And then suddenly, the Vault Dweller and his puppet massacred all of the slavers in the area, spreading a message all over the wasteland. Beware the Puppet Man. Vault 77 is a creepy tale of how one man was driven to utter insanity and because of it is now a paranoid schizophrenic who will kill anyone in his way, believing he is being told to do it through his puppet Vault Boy. Vault 79's contents were hidden to the world for a long time, located within a small shack out in the middle of nowhere, with access to it through a locked off elevator. The original occupation number for this vault was 120 dwellers. That number was chosen because of the vault's location within the mining area, and 120 being the atomic number of gold, which the vault would also be used to store and protect when in operation. The vault was under the command of the military forces from Fort Knox, with the sole purpose of rebuilding the United States of America economy. Whilst this vault was incredibly hidden from the rest of society with security surrounding the grounds, it wasn't long before its secrets were revealed by a few of the soldiers working near there. In July 2072, some of the soldiers working there stole millions of dollars and went gambling in Las Vegas. The rest of the forces found this information and a shootout occurred within the Ultralux casino to silence them and take back what they stole. Only one survivor remained, that being Sergeant Catherine Montgomery, who had been staying within the Lucky 38. Here she escaped the city after being labelled as a Chinese spy and ventured to Texas. However, sadly, the boat she was escaping on was destroyed by the USS Wade. However, all of this commotion led to more people seek out what was at the hidden vault. However, anyone who went to seek out this vault were killed in the process, with Flavia Stabo, another interested party, being buried in the shallow grave near the vault's entrance for trying to get into it and revealing its true location. As the war came, the vault like all the others was sealed up with its inside waiting for the message from the outside that the gold deposits were needed. But during their lockdown point a mutiny took place, being led by a secret service agent nicknamed Shorty, killing most of the other inhabitants. By 2103 rumours of this vault and its treasure drew people everywhere as they wanted the gold for themselves. As the vault was finally raided, those who took part in it would be rewarded by the remnants of the vault's secret service, with them also being able to tell the tale of what was in Vault 79. This vault was one of the most secret vaults throughout all of America. However, now the tale of its raid lives throughout Appalachia. Vault 81 is a bit of a misleading vault and is like many of the other ones on this list and the last. At first when entering this vault would look like a standard control vault that would be a nice piece for existence for the vault dwellers living there. However, this wasn't the case. In fact, Vault 81 had an experiment taking place here that was not told to the residents once again. The sole purpose of this vault was to research diseases and antibodies with an emphasis on potential mutations in heavy radiation. Here Vault Tech isolated the 96 residents within the vault from the experiments taking place, using them as guinea pigs for their trials. So many processes were put in place to make sure the vault dwellers were not contaminated or spread what they had to the outside world. All was set up for Vault Tech to make sure these experiments would go exactly how they planned. However, they made one big mistake. That was assigning Dr. Olivier as the overseer. Dr. Olivier disagreed massively with these experiments and went against Vault Tech's ultimate plans, stating that if human trials were to take place, they would blow the whistle on what was truly going on. However, Dr. Olivier realized if she did blow the whistle, this experiment was far higher than they thought, having financial investors from the federal government, meaning it would be much harder to expose them. As the Great War came, Dr. Olivier got the call to alert the scientists. However, she refused to do it, to make sure the experiments didn't go ahead. However, there was one problem. Three more scientists had arrived in the vault asking questions about the vault 
Holtz drills. These scientists helped the team crack on with their experiments. However, Dr. Olivia kept an eye on them, making sure they didn't get to the human testing part. As it finally got to that stage of the experiment, Dr. Olivia disabled all the delivery systems, cutting off the scientists from infecting the vault dwellers. She also sealed off the access point to the secret part of the vault where the scientists were located, making sure they could never go on with their plans, also killing the three outsider scientists in the process. Dr. Olivier was regretful of what she had done, however knew that the scientists on the other side would have enough food and water to survive. The scientists, however, continued with their research and used mole rats as their main source of testing. As time went past, the scientists would eventually die of old age, and the sole responsibility of the tests and the cure would lie in the hands of the Miss Nanny robot named Curie. By 2204, Curie had created the cure, meaning the vault's true goal had been achieved. At the same time, Curie became self-aware and patiently waited within the vault, hoping that she would get a response from the vault's security or get a new order for her to leave the vault and begin a new line of research. By 2277, the rest of the vault dwellers could not isolate themselves any longer, and Overseer McNamara opened the doors for the first time to make trade links as they were quickly running out of resources. This event helped the vault dwellers to make vital repairs to their deteriorating vault, as well as bring in more food and medical supplies. However, a lot of the vault dwellers detest this decision as they had a very xenophobic mindset, distrusting anyone who stepped foot in their precious home. By 2287, the vault continued to let in a small selection of individuals to make trade, but still kept isolated from the outside world. Within this year, however, one individual named Bobby DeLuca would discover the secret part of the vault where the scientists once were and ventured in, revealing all of the diseased mold rats who inhabited it. Another individual named Austin would be bitten by these diseased rats, leading him to need immediate treatment, forcing someone to go and find the cure the scientists had been working on. Whilst in the end Vault 81's experiments didn't fully go ahead, the secret vault with all its experiments still remains, and with it, a cure to the many diseases the scientists were playing with over the many years they inhabited it. Vault 87 is one of the most significant vaults throughout all of America and had a huge effect on the wasteland. Vault 87 was made in 2071, powered by the state-of-the-art equipment such as Cyberbrain version 2.3, a nuclear reactor, and four stasis chambers, as well as housing a Garden of Eden creation kit. The vault did have an original experiment in mind when it was set up. However, as the war waged on, the experiment was changed to study the effects of the forced evolutionary virus on humans. The goal of the scientist was to make a version of the virus that would help create eight humans that were well adapted to the post-nuclear environment and would label the experiment as the Evolutionary Experimentation Program. The experiment, however, was a total failure and only created failed subjects and inferior mutants, now known as the super mutants. For the most part, the scientists were safe and operations continued as followed. However, as the bombs fell, one fell directly on top of the vault, literally in the land with radiation. After this, some of the specimens broke free and started to attack all of the scientists and security forces within the vault. Eventually, the human inhabitants were wiped out by the mutants as the mutants ventured out into the wasteland. Their sole goal now was to preserve their species as they were completely sterile because of the experiments. The mutants would go out of their way to capture humans and subject them to the FEV virus to make more for their society. This would happen for decades as more and more mutants roamed the lands all over America. By 2277, the vault was in a state of disrepair repair. Maintenance was not taking place and parts of the vault were completely collapsing, sealing off certain areas. On top of that, any human that were to venture into this vault would be hit by overwhelming amounts of radiation that would certainly kill them, especially within the heart of the vault where the Gek lies. Once again, Vault 87 is another example of how experimenting on humans for the purpose of war only leads to more problems later down the line. Vault 88 is really unlike any of the other vaults on this list as it wasn't actually ever finished before the war. As the war took place in 2077, this vault was still under construction near a uranium deposit to make sure there would be a steady supply of nuclear material for the vault's future purposes. When the bombs came, most of the workers located here were killed or heavily mutated in the process, as the vault wasn't fully functional and could not provide them with adequate protection. After being hit by the nuclear bombs, the entrance was also completely covered 
uncovered by rubble, meaning that for years its existence was completely hidden, leading some to believe that Vault 88 never existed at all. Eventually it was discovered thanks to some curious raiders as they removed the rubble and tried to gain access through the door. Amazingly, the overseer Valerie Barstow had survived after 200 years, though heavily ghoulified. As the raiders tried desperately to get in, overseer Valerie kept the doors sealed, stating they could not enter as she needed to keep the vault safe so it could one day focus on its experiments. Ultimately, Dr. Stanislav Braun wanted Vault 88 to be a testing vault for unreleased prototypes of all forms. They would be tested within Vault 88 on the inhabitants and then moved on to other vaults around the country. The testing of these prototypes would also be under the rules that human lives were expendable and that getting these prototypes out fast was more important. With the vault not being completed before the war, the vault now lies empty, ready to be turned into that vault that was meant to be built before the bombs fell. Whoever were to enter Vault 88 would be given the opportunity to help save Overseer Valerie, who was trapped under the rubble, clear the rubble from all of the access tunnels, clearing out the feral ghouls out in the process as well, and help her to fulfill her role as Overseer and get those prototypes built and tested on unaware individuals who also want to seek out what Vault 88 has to offer, eventually setting up their own community. Vault 92 was set up for those obsessed with music. This vault was designed to hold 245 occupants for 100 years and was supplied with a ton of sound equipment, musical instruments and recording gear to make it so that the musical legacy of the United States was forever preserved. Sounds amazing, right? Well, it had a second mission behind it as well, like most of the other vaults. When the vault officially closed on the 23rd of October 2077, the overseer Richard Rubin would use the sound systems to filter white noise throughout the vault that would contain combat suggestions to the humans hearing these noises. The first tests were on the musicians isolated within the sound booths, which worked with great effect as two of the dwellers located within the recording studio formed an inseparable romance. Due to this initial success, the range of the white noise was extended throughout all of the vaults to make sure it was fully working. The white noise was also accompanied with music to make sure the full broadcast could be spread to everyone and would feel more natural. The experiment worked even better with its effectiveness being noted as 100% with less than 1% margin of error. The scientists were thrilled with what they had found and congratulated each other for the achievement. However, not long after this, the first problem was visible. One musician suddenly went insane, murdering three other dwellers in a bloody rage. This musician had no previous links with violence or mental instability, and it became clear that the white noise could be the cause of this. But the professor in charge of all this saw the music musician's change as notable for his research. Before he was killed, he showed increased strength, tenacity, and unflinching obedience to orders from authority. But on top of all that, it was also revealed that they had lost all higher cognition and motor control, and were experiencing nausea and dizziness. Eventually, more and more of these vault dwellers were experiencing these same feats. Fatalities were happening all over the vault, and the professor was begging the overseer to abandon the project and restore order within the vault. After a short while, 30 percent of the vault's population were claimed to be clinically insane and 35 were dead. The experiment was deemed a failure and was claimed that the white noise had just turned the humans into mindless brutes. The remaining vault dwellers tried desperately to escape the vault, taking up arms against the others who had lost their minds. But the professor learned the truth of this experiment during this time. He found out that the overseer was controlling all of it, boosting it into their sleeping quarters at night instead of just the studios, deeming the overseer to be in insane, the professor faced the overseer to hold him accountable for his crimes. To this date, Vault 92 is a crumbling mess with all of its maintenance crews dead. It is flooded and is void of any real human life. What could have been a great place for the vault dwellers where they could make music together and embrace the old world sounds, this place was now a barren littered place with the bodies of humans who went insane due to the overseer's experiments. Vault 94 is located out within the mire within Appalachia. This vault had one goal in mind, to allow humanity the opportunity to be free, walk their own path, and be one with nature. Its main principles were that of faith, 
non-violence, and communal life in harmony with nature. It was also supplied with a ton of resources to restore the bounty of the earth in the hope that one day the residents of this vault would rebuild the belief that humanity is naturally good. After just one year, the vault dwellers of 94, after praying for their victims of the war, opened the vault doors and they ventured out into the wasteland to spread the goodwill of men to all they encountered. However, on exiting, they would be killed and tortured by the raiders of Pleasant Valley, with their bodies being propped up as decorations. The raiders would also go on to find that the vault housed a Gek, but they were unaware of what it truly was. Because they didn't know what it did, they would go on to blow it up, deeming it dangerous because of how submissive the vault dwellers had been. However, on its destruction, it would blow them up in the process, and with the explosion would lead the Gek to go on to create the whole area of the Mere. Ironically, the people of Vault 94 who believed that humanity was good were one of the first group of vault dwellers to be killed once emerging back onto the surface. However, they did help create greenery to the wasteland once again, so they did achieve something anyway, even if they didn't technically do it. Vault 95 was designed for just 75 dwellers and more specifically for dwellers who were addicted to drugs. This vault was set up to offer those individuals a chance to be rehabilitated as well as sheltered from the upcoming war. Every day these vault dwellers would have meetings about their recovery and the dwellers would go through a process of positive reinforcement and encouragement, making them feel like they were a family going through the same thing. By 2082 the vault dwellers were able to become clean all thanks to the overseer being a position of their therapist to some extent, with their idea of not to be considered a position of power, but rather a position of support and servitude. However, an undercover Vault Tech employee named Gutierrez had a different goal. His plan was to open a secret stash of various addictive chems and alcohol sealed inside the living quarters. This was part two of Vault Tech's experiment that was to happen five years after the vault door shut. As the stash of drugs was found, the dwellers went back to their old ways, becoming addicted again and extremely aggressive towards one another, with deaths happening all throughout their community. By 2287, however, the faction of the Gunners had set up within the vault after fighting their way through and killing all of the remaining dwellers who remained there. The vault is in disrepair and its goal of rehabilitation was completely in ruin. What could have been a great place to give people a second chance was once again ruined by vault Tech and their barbaric experiments. This vault was set up to be like an ark, a place of preservation for wildlife and the flora and fauna of the future. The reason for its setup was to make sure the world could be brought back to its original ways of wildlife and the wasteland could be repopulated by the old world's nature. Within this vault there was to be a large selection of animals and embryos, 10,000 to be precise, that were all stored within cryogenic storage. As the small group of scientists began working they would monitor the outside world to see its surface conditions and how it affected affected the wildlife. However, as the war came, their new directive came from vault Tech, something that would not go down well with the workers at all. Their new instructions were now to conduct genetic experiments on the fauna and to develop countermeasures for them. Once this was done, they would then have to transfer their findings to an external facility where they would be checked to make sure the workers were hitting their correct weekly quotas made up by the mainframe. The five residents were outraged at the vault Tech member and overseer Eric DeMarcos, stating that this was far too dangerous to mutate over 10,000 animals with such a small group and certainly not what they had signed up for. However, despite Despite Eric apologising, he went on to say that if they did not meet their quotas, they would ultimately be exterminated. Whilst this helped the workers to get on with their studies, this also hid another Vault Tech secret about this vault. That being that after the 250 weeks of work here, regardless of how they did, the residents were to eventually be exterminated with only the overseer being able to leave the facility. As the weeks passed, the scientists got on with their research and noted all the changes made. But by week 142, 
2, the scientists discovered a brand new mutation when they uncovered a new mysterious entity named X001, contained within the bay only accessed by the automated research system. This new mutation formed from X001 was unlike anything seen before as it spread from petri dish to petri dish in rapid speed. However, only having a small sample of X001 and being unable to access the rest of it, the scientist working on this mutation, Nina, was unable to hit her weekly quota, meaning she was to be killed. However, during this process, the overseer had been working for two years on an escape plan. He was also prisoner within this vault. Here, Eric created a virus called the Seraph, which was to override the mainframe computer shutting it down, allowing him to escape the day before the quotas were due. But unfortunately, on the day of their attempted escape, the mainframe activated superseding protocol Omega and killed all the residents of the vault. Whilst the mainframe regained control, the now mutated creatures had now started to escape the vault, causing the main vault door to become broken in the process. In a desperate plea for assistance, the mainframe computer now sends a call all over Appalachia for someone to help resolve the issue. What was once an idyllic vault that could help rebuild the wasteland is now a death trap run by the computer that stopped its residents from escaping by exterminating each and every one of them, allowing the creatures housed there to escape and roam the post-war land. Arguably the most recognizable vault on this list, Vault 101 was a simple vault that looked to be once again a standard control vault. However, this was not the case. In fact, Vault 101 had an experiment, but an extremely subtle one that not many people noticed, which was as intended. The experiment here was to stay closed indefinitely in order to study the role of the overseer when a vault never opened. This, however, did not benefit the gene pool at all, as it would lead to inbreeding if they were to be isolated for so many years. It also later on led to the overseer being seen as almost a dictator-like figure, with one of the questions of the GOAT exam showing just how much he liked to control things. This experiment to keep the vault closed forever failed multiple times over the years, however. The first and second overseers of the vault did their jobs perfectly, and the second one even made sure that the vault's mantra was, we are born in the vault, we live in the vault, and we die in the vault. Something that remained in the vault society to this date. However, in 2241, the new overseer went against those rules and favored outside contact, assembling a team led by Anne Palmer to venture the land and find mutations along the way. Eventually on the 10th of February, 2241, the first team from Vault 101 ventured out and visited the town of Megaton, collecting samples of the outside world to study in their labs back in Vault 101. By 2258, some of the vault dwellers who ventured out to Megaton returned to Vault 101. However, the overseer that had allowed them to do so had now gone and had been preceded by Alphonse Amadova. This brought about a new age of Vault 101, where it would turn into a police state to make sure no one ever left the vault, returning it to its original plans. During this time, a man named James ventured to Vault 101, seeking shelter with his new child after losing his wife in the birth process. James convinced the overseer that he would be their new physician if he let them in. Eventually, he was allowed entrance and was assigned Jonas Palmer as his assistant. But people were still escaping the vault to head to Megaton, forcing the overseer to take action, scaring people into thinking the outside world was too dangerous and that his voice was the only voice of reason. By 2277, society had gone back to its original ways, fearing leaving the vault and remaining inside as per the original Vault Tech Directive. However, in an attempt to bring about clean water for the whole wasteland in what was known as Project Purity, something James's wife had worked with him on, James left his now teenager alone in the vault and escaped to make a dream a reality. This put the whole vault on lockdown with Jonas being killed in the process for helping him escape. In a mass panic, the overseer's daughter, Amata, wakes James's child and tells them they need to escape as well. With no other option, the 19-year-old breaks through and ventures to the surface, becoming the lone wanderer. To this date, Vault 101 is still operational. However, Amata has set up a rebel faction to make changes within Vault 101 and help it interact with the outside world. But whilst doing this, Vault 101 would get contacted by the Enclave, who wanted to gain entrance to the vault. Refusing entrance to the vault, 
times. Amata would broadcast a message out onto emergency frequency to the capital wasteland in the hope that maybe the lone wanderer she helped escape Vault 101 will return and help their once home out from the paranoid controlling overseer who tried to kill their father as well as some of their friends. Vault 106 was one of the fastest constructed vaults in the wasteland, being finished in just five years in December 2069. This vault was to house 107 occupants, with 95 being the test subjects and 12 being the researchers from Vault Tech. The experiment was said to last for 12 years and three months from the moment of its sealing. This vault had a pretty clear experiment in mind. This was to pump psychoactive drugs into the circulation system 10 days after the vault door closed. Once this day came, all the procedures took place and the drugs were released into the system at 1530 hours. Residents however were not told about this at all and if they were to complain that something was wrong they would just be told it was fine. This gas became deadly almost instantly. A lot of the vault dwellers became extremely relaxed and in almost comatose states. However some became extremely aggressive and behaving bizarrely. After a while most of the vault dwellers became highly aggressive believing to see things that weren't there and killing anyone in their way. The security team who were told to handle the situation could not take on the highly aggressive individuals and died within the process. As time progressed, these drugs still filtered through the system, creating a purple haze and causing individuals to hallucinate things if venturing through. To this day, the vault is still active, with people attacking one another when in there, but its foundations are collapsing and it won't be long before it completely falls. But if you were to enter this vault, you would be heavily affected by this drug, seeing things that aren't there and most likely be attacked by someone else who is in an angered state or become an aggressive yourself. Vault 108 was a much larger vault than the previous ones in the list, housing around 475 occupants with an estimated runtime of 38 years. With this it also housed one of the largest armories which was overstocked by triple the amount as the other vaults to help with its experiment. This vault's main goal was like that of Vault 51's, it was to study conflict for leadership and power amongst its dwellers. With this the vault was run by overseer Brody Jones who had been diagnosed with a rare form of cancer which was said to kill him within 40 months of the experiment's starting date, meaning this role would soon be up for grabs. The vault's power was also said to turn off and malfunction within just 20 years, despite the residents being locked up for 38 years. Due to these factors, a struggle for power took place and a huge gunfight broke out between the residents. After this brutal in-vault war, the vault dwellers now faced a huge problem. Their population numbers were extremely low, and to survive, they had to come up with a plan to expand their population. Here the vault dwellers decided to start cloning an individual to see the outcome. During this process a man named Gary would be cloned and each one of his clones would be recorded to see what was different from the last and the original. Recording their efforts the dwellers would find that each clone made they would get more and more hostile to non-Gary clones, with each one being made becoming more and more violent. After the 53rd Gary had been made the dwellers realized there was no real differences to this new one and now they had to work out what to do with all the Gary as they were running out of room, leading to some of the dwellers taking some of the clones out and killing them to allow for more space in their labs. However, one more Gary was made but this time Gary 54 attacked Dr. Peterson during his examination. After this, it is pretty certain that the Gary clones rebelled against all of the non-clones, taking over Vault 108 completely. Through their cloning process, however, the clones have lost all sense of communication and can only speak through one word. Gary. As of 2277, the vault is overrun by Garys, as they will attack anyone that gets close to them. If you were to venture into this vault, you may find yourself overwhelmed by the same man, and the last word you'll ever hear before you die will be just simply, Gary. Yeah. Yeah.
Vault 111 was yet again a very simple experiment vault that wasn't located in a very large premises. The most notable thing about this vault was that instead of having a traditional door like most of the vaults on this list, it instead had a giant lift leading down to its entrance for extra protection from the radiation. Going down into the area, the vault would seem like a nice place to live with extremely welcoming scientists and vault security staff. However, as usual, there was another agenda behind it all. This vault was to explore the effects of long term cryogenic stasis on unsuspecting test subjects who were residents within Sanctuary Hills and Concord. Because the subjects would be in stasis pods for a long period of time, the scientists would only be there for at least 180 days before being told to evacuate and move to another area where they could monitor them from a distance. However, the staff were also part of this test as they quickly realized that there was no all clear signal coming soon. Supplies were running out and panic was ensuring amongst everyone, leading to the security team mutating against the overseer to open the door and escape. After a firefight ensued, lots of the staff were killed in the process, with most of the survivors believing to have escaped the vault. As for those in the cryopods, they would remain frozen for over a century or more, waiting to be brought back into the world to face the harsh reality of the Commonwealth Wasteland. However, only one lone individual survived this ordeal, with all the other residents being killed within the pods due to our malfunction and suffocating to death, with one being shot in cold blood right in front of their other half, with the raiders taking the child and disappearing into the Commonwealth Wasteland. Vault 112 was a pretty horrible vault to be wound up in, as it was run by the insane sadistic scientist known as Stanislaus Braun. This vault was one of the last vaults to be made by vault as it finished construction in 2074. 85 residents were said to live within this vault and would be hooked up to a virtual reality world for the indefinite duration of the vault's experiments. At first, this would be seen as a pretty unique and fun place to live. Having your own personal VR pod, you could immerse yourselves into the universe utopia set up by Stanislaus Braun to allow you to live a perfect life for pretty much all of your life. However, the problem was Dr. Braun himself. As soon as the residents entered their pods, they were at the mercy of him and his experiments. Dr. Braun would have complete control over their whole world, using them as play dolls to his own sick fantasies without allowing you to leave at all. This would go on for some time, and when Dr. Braun got bored of that utopia, he would then go on to kill the residents and then set up a new one, forcing these people to a life of torture and to be killed over and over again to satisfy one doctor's needs. Eventually, one of Braun's Vault 112 Utopia worlds would be shut down by the Lone Wanderer as they search for their father James. However, Dr. Braun just about lives still within his VR pod, and if anyone were to open it, his body would basically shrivel into dust. How these people have stayed alive so long is beyond a miracle, and probably due to their minds being kept active within the pods. However, it is a life of torture, and maybe shutting down Dr. Braun's Utopia worlds would be better for them than living within this hell. Vault 114 was another vault that never really saw the light of day. Vault Tech tried to create this vault within the Boston Park Street subway station in a mission to cut costs. But even though they were saving money, the vault was never completed due to their poor construction contracts. Those in charge of the construction just ended up embezzling funds. The idea behind this vault was to provide a safe shelter for the high ups at the Boston Society who wanted to live out the nuclear devastation in their luxury shelter. Instead, those 120 residents residents would be put in accommodation similar to poor housing, with multiple families per room, a lack of amenities, and poor pieced together furnishings. The overseer was also chosen from the public and was set out to study human reactions to stress. To this date, the vault was never really used as its construction was never fully completed, with interview tapes littering its overseer's office, telling the story of how vault Tech were looking for that perfect overseer candidate. It did at one point have some residents within it, but it 
it is unclear where those individuals have gone or if they have died at some point. But as of 2287, a group of trigger men run by the gangster known as Skinny Malone operate within the vault, holding one detective, Nick Valentine, as their hostage. If 114's construction was ever finalized, this vault could have been a luxury paradise. But instead, it is now a place of residence for criminals seeking to build their empire and silence those who go against them. Like with Vault 114, Vault 118 was also meant to be set up as a luxury ultra elite hotel to attract the right type of customer from across the land. But unlike 114, 118 was actually set up that way and had a hotel above it to make sure those privileged individuals and VIPs would come and gather there. However, the plan for opening was very different. When the Great War came, the door would open up and allow the population access, picking people from the local working class population. Once allowed in, the working class population would be escorted through the luxury part of the vaults to see it in all its beauty, but then be assigned to cramped quarters away from that area. The vault dwellers would then be separated into two groups. Group A would be the 10 ultra elite individuals who would be allowed special access to everything and would be above the law. Group B would be the 300 working class and will be restricted to just the second wing of the vault. This group would be forced to live in uncomfortable and cramped conditions with food rations to be extremely limited and rules and laws to be set in place by Group A and robotic staff members. The ultimate test here was to see how the two class systems responded to one another, monitoring how the working class reacted to being told what to do by people who could do anything they wanted without repercussion. However, the second one was never made in the end, as the finances were cut off, meaning the experiment could not go ahead. The ultra elite, however, continued to invest in this vault, and one specific resident known as Dr. Riggs decided another fate for the residents. Dr. Riggs worked for General Atomics with advanced robotics programming, specifically the RoboBrain project. With this, he and his wife convinced the other members of Group A that the only way they could survive this was to have their brains inserted into RoboBrains. As the war came, the vault was eventually sealed, and now the Group A residents, now RoboBrains, lived within the vault, making sure no one else could venture into their place of luxury. Only one human remained however, that being the Overseer, making them the only test subject. As the time progressed, however, the Robobrains became mad and the Overseer died in the process. Seeking isolation from the outside world, their plans to remain on their own would be changed as a murder took place within the vault, forcing the residents to seek outside help through a detective. What Vault 118 proves is that the ultra elite are just a bit weird, to be honest. And the final vault in the Fallout series that is registered as canon is the Unfinished Vault, also known as the Fake Vault 13. Like many of the vaults on this list, this vault never really came to fruition. Instead, it was just a cave which was to be the construction site of a vault that was never numbered. Whilst it is evident that the vault does not exist, one man named Merc within the NCR convinces people all over that he knows of Vault 13's location and will sell the hollow disk with it for $1,000. On it, however, is just a blank cave where this unfinished vault was to be built, officially labelling this site as the Fake Vault 13. Who knows what Vault Tech planned here? Maybe it was more drug experiments. Maybe it was another cloning facility to make more Gary clones to take over the wasteland. Maybe it was more FEV testing areas. But one thing is for certain, if this vault ever did get finalised, knowing Vault Tech's history, you know it was probably going to be bad news for whoever ended up there. And now after covering all of the ones from the mainline games, we have the non-canon and cut vaults, which are ones that were either meant to be in the base game themselves as part of cancelled video games, and some that are part of the extended universe but are not canon in the slightest, as they are part of an alternate timeline or other things. We start off with Vault Zero. 
Was Vault Zero was part of the fully released Fallout Tactics game back in 2001 by Interplay and Bethesda, its lore and everything within the game is still listed and labelled as non-canon by Todd Howard himself, mainly due to how it changes some of the things set up in previous games. Whilst not all of it is seen as non-canon, Vault Zero is listed as such and continues to be a talking point within the community about whether it should be or shouldn't be. Vault Zero was created within Colorado and was said to be the main hub for all the vaults around the country, the nucleus of the entire vault network some would say. It was said that when the outside world needed to be rebuilt, Vault Zero with its incredible machinery would execute the Exodus Protocol, reuniting the vaults and would start taming the outside land when the atmosphere returned to stable levels again. Within Vault Zero housed an extremely important and advanced piece of equipment called the Calculator, a supercomputer that was linked to an organic brain to help it with its processing power. The Calculator would ultimately run everything needed within Vault Zero and would allow it to create all the tasks it needed to to rebuild the land. Food, water, energy, life support, everything was set up so that Vault Zero could thrive and could fulfill its goal of rebuilding the wasteland. However, this sadly was not to go ahead. Before the war, the committee members responsible for the construction of the vault introduced budget cuts, with 30 voting for this and 3 opposing this. This meant that the budget for Vault Zero went from being $24 billion to $2.3 billion, with that money going back into the pockets of the committee members. With money being taken away from the vault systems and structure, the committee now decided to go a different direction, building up luxury areas such as a leisure facility, several top quality restaurants with 10,000 square feet of cold storage, seven smoke rooms with piano bars, and two subterranean hunting grounds stocked with rare animals that were bought from world-renowned zoos. This was all done because a lot of them thought the war was never actually going to come, so instead of building up shelter, they would build up their lifestyle, setting aside $12.4 billion for this. However, war did come on the 23rd of October 2077, and the committee members were caught off guard. Whilst the whole of America was turned to ash, the calculator within Vault Zero did nothing, instead went into a slumber and remained hidden underground. It wasn't until 2196 where the calculator woke back up after a group of super mutants ventured into Vault Zero's perimeter. Believing they were foreign troops invading the US, the calculator launched the emergency pacification protocol and met the super mutants with a heavy assault robot bot named the Behemoth and started executing them. But problems didn't stop there. Because of the budget cuts, a lot of the systems within Vault Zero started failing. Things like the backup computer systems damaged the electro-organic linking terminal, which would lead to 63% of the population dying, with 15% of them suffering life-altering brain damage, meaning they could not look after themselves. Among the dead were some of the lead scientists, the only people who could actually fix the damages caused to the Vault systems. With all of these damages, and system failures, the calculator started executing pacification protocol and expanding its operations out into the Buena Vista nuclear reactor complex, as well as the industrial facilities in Canyon City and Great Bend. Thus began an age of extermination, led by the calculator, who sought to wipe out all of those who inhabited the new wasteland of America. Back in 2007, Fallout was still looking to go down the route of a turn-based RPG like its previous games. With this, Fallout 3 was to be under development under the codename of Van Buren, with the developer being Black Isle Studios, the sister company of Interplay Entertainment, just before they went bankrupt. During Van Buren's development, a tech demo was made to showcase some of the mechanics of this game, the location within the Great Midwest and Commonwealth, as well as a new vault. This vault, although it had no numbers or textures on its door, would be labelled as Vault 1, and would be used within a tutorial for the player at the beginning of the game as well as the tech demo. Vault 1 was said to be based within a midwestern city with an easy to access entrance in a cliffside. Vault 1 was meant to be Vault Tech's first ever vault made under Project Safehouse and following the huge success of the Los Angeles Demonstration Vault. As the Great War started and the bombs began to fall, the military would start escorting all of the nearby residents to this specific vault, with Corporal Armstrong personally escorting 
escorting one individual to the shelter. But this vault was in a horrific condition as the overseer had not yet arrived with the temporary one taking their place. This temporary overseer would be known as Frank and he would struggle to maintain this vault as it constantly fought against him as he was quoted as saying, we have a whole bunch of problems, something's wrong with the generator and I can't fix it because I'm locked out. I went to go get the floating eye bots to fix it but something's wrong with him too. Ultimately within this vault nothing worked, the life support systems were down, generators could not supply enough power and as quoted by Frank, the eye bot was badly damaged. However, it was said that this new resident who turned up to live within the vault was able to help the residents of this vault with supplies and repair the much needed vault systems. Vault 2 is a bit of a weird vault that's only mentioned within the holotape minigame labelled Waste Lad within Fallout 76. Vault 2 was said to be a sports obsessed vault built into the cliffs and guards the way to the abandoned armory and Chairman Cheng's fortress. Whilst it's written down now where the vault is located, the only way of gaining entrance to this vault is to retrieve the lucky number 2 jersey and bring it to the vault. Once bringing it back, the overseer will have completed their sports collection and with that, the Waste Lad will be granted free access throughout the vault. If you were to go to Vault 2, if it truly existed, you would have to be a massive sports fan, because if you aren't, you'd most likely be chucked out by their sports collection obsessed overseer. After the huge success of Fallout 1 and 2, developers 14 Degrees East started working on a new Fallout game titled Fallout Extreme that was to be published by Interplay. This was to be a first and third person tactical game looking to be set within the Midwestern branch of the Brotherhood of Steel. Here you would control a four person team and be able to switch characters at any time. However, the game never came to light as it was never officially announced and was only really shown to be a thing within 2010. Within this game, however, existed Vault 6, another vault located within the Mount St. Helens area in Washington state. But sadly, like many on this list, not much is known about Vault 6 as this game's development was very small and still not much is known about what happened during it. It's listed that there was probably an experiment within this vault, however, once again, it is unknown what exactly that was and any other information on its design, residence, population size is all unknown. One mod of Fallout New Vegas named Fallout Frontier did reveal this vault finally and placed it within Portland linking it to the quest called Vault of the Living Dead. This vault would be hard to access however with the vault door not fully opening, however the player can access it through the sewers to reveal everything that is inside. Whilst probably not containing what was meant to originally be within the vault, it is still a nice way to explore what Vault 6 could have potentially laid out to all those who entered. Vault 7 is a pretty quick one to cover and unknown really if it's canon, non-canon or just simply doesn't count in the slightest, but we're going to cover it anyway. Vault 7 was part of the board game Fallout, which was released in 2017. Here for the original game, the players are given a set narrative and can choose how they go about playing it. Vault 7 is one of those locations the player can travel to and loot and is situated in the middle of the board. Vault 7's narrative changes each game, so realistically it has no real set purpose or experiment until the game has begun. In the end, the player decides the fate of Vault 7 and what there is to explore within it. Sadly, once again, Vault 24 is another one where we know next to nothing about it, only being able to acquire a Vault 24 jumpsuit within Fallout New Vegas. As much as I'd love to guess what Vault 24 had in it, other than an unmarked location, a generic vault symbol and a jumpsuit means it is impossible to guess what it could have been made for, and for that we just have to move on to the next vault on this list, which is Vault 39. In 2004, the Fallout spin-off game named Fallout Brotherhood is still released and was received with mixed opinions. It didn't take too long before Interplay decided it was going to work on its follow-up game to it, which would continue that story. However, the same year, Fallout Brotherhood of Steel 2 was cancelled, and with it, Vault 39 was removed from the universe. Vault 39 was to be known as the Lone Star Vault, or the old Abilene Vault located within the area known as Abilene before the Great War. Sadly, the experiment going on with 
been the vault is unknown. However, like Vault 22 and 94, it would appear it was something similar to this, as the vault is now like a jungle with huge mutated plants that take over everything in their way. Within this vault also lies a Garden of Eden creation kit, which can still be accessed as well as access to a nearby shed which contains information on the tribe known as the Jackals, as well as their leader named Banshee. But the most important thing about this vault and its nearby shed was that it contained a map that had all the key Brotherhood of Steel locations. Vault 39 would have been a key location within this adventure that would have expanded on the Brotherhood of Steel story. However, due to yet another cancelled game, we may never get to visit the jungle, plant-infested world of Vault 39. Another vault based on the Fallout board game, this time within the Fallout New California expansion. Vault 44 was meant to be a secret section that would be used for housing dangerous creatures with robots guarding and feeding them while scientists researched them. This would have happened without the vault dwellers knowing anything about it. However, due to how much power was being used by all of the containers and machinery, things started to fail. The main vault's refrigerator failed at the start, meaning that most of the food supply ran out and went bad. Insects also started in invading the vault which ruined the rest of the food supply and making it uneatable for the dwellers. On top of all those problems, the overseer had no way of reopening the vault door, meaning that eventually all of the vault dwellers would perish inside. Some of the scientists continued their work and tried desperately to send their studies back to vault Tech, but their communication went unanswered. To this date, the creatures inside are still alive, being fed the contaminated food by the robot helpers. Vault 44 just sits there in the wasteland, waiting for someone to come and open it up once again and discover what had happened to all those living inside. Vault 65 is sadly another vault which Bethesda decided to take out of Fallout 76, but unlike Vault 63, it is not accessible at all within the game. It is unknown what Vault 65 would have had within it, as its experiments are also unknown. But one thing that is known is that it would have had a similar design to Vaults 51 and 94. It is said that feral ghouls now inhabit this vault with a glowing one roaming the areas. It could be that this vault had a generator malfunction or the door did not fully work, meaning its residents are now heavily ghoulified. But sadly, like a lot on this list, we may never know what vault Tech had planned for Vault 65 and its inhabitants. Vault 74 is another odd one as it was meant to be a vault that helped the player during the Fallout 3 GEC tutorial, a program that would allow players to create and edit their own content for the game. Whilst it never really showed up within Fallout 3, it actually turned up within Fallout New Vegas as an accessible vault that could be explored. When entering Vault 74, it is clear that it is a very small vault, only having a few rooms within it, almost as if it was catered for a few unique individuals for overseer training or something similar. It was said to house a ton of fiends now, who must have broken into the vault and taken it for themselves. However, exploring this vault, it seems something else is wrong. The overseer's office is the drawing point for anyone venturing in, and when looking at the overseer's terminal, it reads, data log 10.44. The vault has been breached. There was not enough power to level 5. God have mercy on our souls. Whatever happened here, it was clear that the original residents did not make it, and because of it, the small Vault 74 is now home to the vicious faction of the Fiends. Going back to the board game of Fallout is another vault, Vault 84. This vault was said to be like 101 where it would be closed almost its entirety, not allowing many insiders in at all. They did however have the trade link with another vault before that one was destroyed, meaning that they weren't completely desperate for resources. The unique thing about this vault however was that like with Vault 11, the people of this vault would have a yearly election amongst all the dwellers. However, instead of it being to see who the next overseer is to sacrifice them to keep them all alive, this time it was to get rid of the person who was deemed as the most dangerous in their community. If you were to be voted as this person, you would then be sent out of the vault by the overseer and may never return to vault 84. The voting process would be a success, however one year that very overseer holding the voting process will be heavily scrutinized, and if documentation is found on her, she herself could be exiled from her own vault. Whilst not as bad as Vault 11, this vault would certainly make you feel extremely paranoid that people will just want to get rid of you from the community completely, meaning you could never return to your home.
Again, Vaults 100 and 113 consists of no real detail as to what they housed within them. The only thing known about these vaults were that Vault 100 was to be part of Fallout 3, so most likely located within the Capital Wasteland somewhere, and Vault 113 was to be in Fallout 4, meaning it was to be located within the Commonwealth. However, all that remains of these vaults is a jumpsuit emote with Vault 100 on it, and a Vault 113 welcome sign graphic, meaning that at some point they were to be full vaults with quest lines, but either due to design choices or poor story, these vaults never made it into their games. Vault 113 however does appear on the Bethesda Fallout pinball table, so it does look like Vault 113 was to be a key one for Fallout 4, but sadly we will never know why it was cut or what they housed behind their vault doors. The final vault within the board game series is Vault 109. This vault was the vault that made the trade links with the people of Vault 84. However, now it is just an abandoned mess of a vault, completely closed off from the outside world. The reason for this was due to a radiation leak which was now completely surrounding the area. What caused this leak is completely unknown, but considering it is located within what looks like a crater, it could be due to a bomb that has gone off in the nearby area, like with Vault 87's area. Before this happened, Vault 109 was an extreme extremely high-end vault with most of its occupants being of the very high class. On top of this, it is heavily armoured possessing a full set of T-60 power armour as well as a fat man. If someone were to heavily protect themselves from radiation, they could somehow gain access to this vault and see what has happened within, gathering precious resources along the way. Another couple of vaults that were mysteriously just cut out of Fallout 4 were vaults 117 and 121. However, the thing about these vaults were that they were shown within a documentary named The History of Bethesda Game Studios, with a map of the Commonwealth displaying the marker for Vault 117, located north of Jamaica Plain, and Vault 121 located in the same spot as where Vault 95 now lies. On top of this, concept art was released of the Vault 117 jumpsuit within the official Art of Fallout 4 book. Why these vaults were removed from the game is unknown, and why 121 was renamed as 95 seems odd, but like with Vault 113, they must have been planned out to have some sort of importance to the story or side missions within the game, but sadly once again they are vaults we will never probably get to see within Fallout 4. Vault 120 is probably the coolest concept for a Fallout vault that is on this list, and only recently has it been revealed what this vault was to house. In an interview in 2021, Todd Howard stated that Vault 120 was said to be located under the waves of Boston Harbor, in a rapture-style location looking out to the ocean bed. Whilst not much is known about what this vault was set out to do, it was said that outside it lived a massive sentient octopus which no doubt would have rebelled against this vault living within its space. I'd like to think that if Vault 120 ever came to fruition, it would be run like a utopia, supposedly free from vault tech control, with a focus on science, art, and business, where a man could do what he likes, and with a key focus on prosperity. However, when you look into the society more, behind that beautiful first impression is a corrupt, disturbing land where people kill each other to get what they want. Maybe one day Fallout will venture into the sea, but for now, Vault 120 was just a dream of an underwater utopia. The Secret Vault was set in the Fallout Brotherhood of Steel game located within Texas under the city of Loss and northwest of the town of Carbon. This vault had one purpose. It was to be an underground research facility where high-ranking personnel could survive the war and continue their scientific research behind the back of the Enclave and the vault experiments. But the most important bit of research going on here was the special version of the forced evolutionary virus as well as curing the side effect of being made sterile from it. The reason this was the secret vault was because as vault tech got bigger and more recognizable, they would begin to help out with the American government and essentially be owned by them. Because of this, they wanted a way to develop advanced technologies without having to give it over to them or live within their own vault experiments. Thus, the secret vault was made. As the scientists continued their research, they would come up with new developments to the FEV, trying to match it to its original designs. However, nothing was as successful as the government's, with the secret bunkers 
Tesla armor being far less effective as the T-51B power armor or the Enclave variant. For a while, the secret bunker continued well. However, during their time, a civil war would break out between vault tech scientists and Blake, the chief security officer, who believed their research on humans was completely unethical. During this battle, an explosion happened, blowing a hole within the biological center, allowing some of the rad roaches and death claws to escape, and allowing rad scorpions and rats to invade the vault. This caused a lot of residents within the vault to die due to these monsters' attacks. During this time, the master had been defeated and his former commander Attis now took the lead of his army. Wanting to seek out where the FEV originated, Attis took his army towards the city of Los, where the rumors of its origins had started. Arriving at Los, however, Attis's army got into a fight with the Church of the Lost and the Brotherhood of Steel Paladins. But in this conflict, Attis used it to search further and eventually found the secret vault, killing all of the inhabitants left inside and taking it over. Attis desperately tried to get into the lower part of the vault, but had to deal with a lot of resistance thanks to the Church of the Lost and the Brotherhood of Steel. Eventually after this series of events, the secret vault was to be completely destroyed as a nuclear warhead was activated by an initiate of the Brotherhood. With it, all the invading forces and monsters were killed in the process with just some of the original residents surviving as they hid within the auxiliary vent shafts and used them to escape. Whilst this vault is not canon, it's still a pretty cool insight into another part of the FEV project and how it affected the the whole of the wasteland. Yet another vault within the Brotherhood of Steel game that isn't officially canon is the Vault Prototype, which is very closely linked to the Secret Vault. This vault's origins are unknown, but it was said to be the original design for what the Secret Vault was to be, or where they would originally come up with the technology ideas and bring them to the Secret Vault before the war began. It was then discovered most likely by the head of the Brotherhood of Steel's Texas expedition, Rhombus, who went on to use it as their main base of operation in their fight against Attis and his super mutants. Within this vault still lies valuable technology such as laser grids, gun bots, functional steam pipes, radioactive drums, and working computers. While it is unsure who exactly found this vault and also why it was made, it is clear that vault Tech were extremely busy here at some point, creating a functional vault filled with technology. Either way, it's clear that without this vault, the secret vault couldn't have come to be, and now it is a dominant base of operations for the Brotherhood of still in Texas. Known only by its name really, the Burkittsville Vault is very limited on the information as no location is given for its existence and no details are listed about its experiments. Originally this vault was meant to be part of Fallout 3, with information about it within the terminal entries within Hamilton's hideaway, but these were cut from the final product. The only thing known about this vault now is that after the war when the doors were sealed shut, a group of crazed cannibals set up camp near the vault entrance and ambushed anyone who tried to reach it, killing them and most likely consuming them. Sadly, whilst this vault did not make it into the game, the cannibal story did happen within the game, just not with the ones that waited outside this mysterious vault known only as the Burkittsville Vault. And the final vault on this list of non-canon and cut vaults is not just one single vault, but in fact pretty much everything within Fallout Shelter. To cover the vaults of Fallout Shelter would mean this video would have more numbers than actual words on a script. If you can think of a number, it's most likely got a vault linked to it in Fallout Shelter. For example, Vault 666 exists within its game, Vault 909, Vault 813, and the list goes on. However, as it is stated within the Fallout lore, there were officially 122 vaults created by vault Tech, so anything above that number simply doesn't exist. Whilst there are multiple quests within the game sending you to these vaults, Fallout Shelter is more like a bit of vault Tech propaganda, a way to make the vault life seem more appealing to those on the outside, where you can form a community and work together to make the world a better place. So whilst this is a pretty relaxed game to play on your phone, Fallout Shelter is absolutely not canon, and as I say, I view it more as something vault Tech would do as propaganda, maybe controlling these dwellers on your phone is actually affecting someone in the Fallout universe. Maybe there is a vault out there that is losing tons of power, food and water because you haven't opened the app in years. Maybe this was vault Tech's plan all along and you and them are their test subjects. Just some food for thought.
A massive thank you for if you got to this part of the video. I really appreciate you checking it out. And do let me know if you like these compilation videos. I always wanted to make them as one big video, but was too afraid at the time. So it's nice to compile them into one long video. Also, a big thank you to my patrons for supporting me still and allow me to do this as a full on career, including my small fishes, my big fishes, Greg and Nox Fox, my YouTube channel Wise Ones, Video Gamer 75 and Sith Lord 906, my sharks, Alfred Correa, Kyle Style 147 and Jason X117 and my Megalodons, Bad Clams 83, Hazy Thoughts and Sinus. If you also want to support this channel, the links are down below, including my merch and also check out the audio versions over on Spotify and other podcast suppliers. But that is all for now. Thank you for watching again. Please do check out my other Fallout videos down below as well as any other games lore that take your fancy. Give this video a like, comment and subscribe if you haven't already to help them get out there. And finally, with all that said, I shall see you all in the next one. Cheers.